This is our community engagement session. I'm about to introduce to you Miriam uh, Boltuck. Miriam was recruited by NASA in 1986 to manage its Solid Earth Science branch. She recognized the need for societal relevance and developed NASA's Natural Hazards Program, which uses space and airborne platforms to study how detection of key features of earthquake, volcano, hurricane, and fire might be used in order to mitigate natural disaster. She was seconded to the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and chaired a 25 agency committee to develop a national earthquake loss reduction strategy, which presented to then President Clinton back in the mid 90s. In 2005, she served on a United Nations committee to develop an international tsunami warning system. Following her retirement, Miriam joined the RFS Binji Royal Brigade, Royal Fire Brigade in 2015. A couple of fun facts about Miriam. Miriam loves horses, is very into horses. That's fun fact one. Fun fact two is that there is up above us Somewhere in our solar system, a little planet called Boltuck, which was named after Miriam about a decade ago. I'm going to say the only presenter at this conference, I'm guessing the only presenter at our conference with a planet named after them. Uh, many years ago, one day after Miriam moved to Washington, D.C. to work at NASA, she met a cute boy called Rob, an Aussie boy called Rob. And so Miriam and her new husband, Rob, have been married for 36 years, live in Australia, have raised three sons. They're now empty nesters. Rob and Miriam participate in Surf Life Saving Special Nippers Program, which helps disabled children enjoy time and mornings at the beach. Miriam joins us to share her experiences from policy level to boots on the ground to show how an active, well-informed community is the first line of defence in mitigating the impact of natural disasters. Please welcome the person with a planet named after her, Miriam Boltar. Thank you, Andrew. That was uh, quite an introduction. Uh, more detail than I expected. Um, and let's see, the formal thing is the ministers I would welcome, but they're not here. And... Uncle Warren had to leave, and so I just get to see RFSC organization. Thank you for organizing this. Thank you all my fellow RFS people for being here. Thanks to the AV team back there, we're counting on you. And um, unlike some of our speakers, I knew when I was five years old what I wanted to be. I just had to wait until I retired to get there. I wanted to be a cowboy and a fireman. <laughs> um, most talks that I give, are about um, uh, having a career in science or about NASA, where I spent most of my professional career. And so um, community engagement is a, a recent love. And there are many people in the room here who have been professionally educated and trained in it, have been doing it for a lot longer. So I'm just going to give you a snapshot of our experiences at Binji. But um, before I do that, I'm going to include some of those other elements into what I'm going to say to you this afternoon. And if there's time, I've got a five-minute video at the end that talks about Australia's crucial role, mission-critical role, in every deep space mission that leaves Earth orbit. And after that, I'd like to leave enough time for you guys to ask me questions about anything, but I expect mostly about space, because I'd rather you ask questions about what you want to hear about than that I, you know, blah, blah, blah to you about what I think you should know. So let's do a quick, it took a long way to get to here. Where's my little pointer? To get there from here, but uh, I'll take you through it quickly and show you some of the best offices I ever had in my life. When I was a little professor at Tulane University, I'm going backwards. That was in the early 1980s. Oops, go back. Dinwiddie Hall, you can see by the cars, and I can tell you it hasn't changed much from when those cars were there. But my office was on the third floor and I had actually five offices and those windows were big enough that I could push them up and forget about health and safety. I could sit in the windowsill, big enough for a whole human being to sit there and uh, just admire Audubon Park and the zoo across the way. Um, my next office, this was in 19... Uh, 
77, 78, I'm dating myself. This is at the University of Pierre Marie Curie. Um, used to be the Sorbonne, but it got split into 14 campuses in the boat sometime in the 60s, right when they were having just as much of the Western world was a lot of sort of youth riots and unrest. And so the University of Paris campus, um, along here, there's a moat, I'm not kidding. Here is the central gate, which can be raised after hours. And here's the Tour Centrale, the central tower, so that if the students really got bad and the moat didn't keep them out and the gate didn't keep them out, the leadership of the university is on the top floor and they had a button to shut down the elevators, so they'd be safe. <laughs> and I was in my office there, was on this level in Tour uh, 26, this uh, 26th tower. And when I was a graduate student at Scripps, who cares about an office? Look at that. So that's my academic career. I, I spent my graduate years, my first undergraduate years at University of Michigan. And first class I took, well, in my senior year, my last year, I took a class in marine geology, standing too close to that and getting some interference. And that was about all the things that were happening in the world and plate tectonics and continental drift. And gosh, what an exciting time that was to be a, a geologist. But you had to go out to sea to do it. And so that's why I went to Scripps Institution to get my PhD in marine geology. And so lots of sea stories, and I won't bore, them, bore you with all of them, but there's nothing like being out on a ship at sea when you're in the tropics and you've got storm squalls and you're on the flying bridge. Maybe you've got a jump rope there to do some exercise because it's hard otherwise, and the captain is really annoyed because you're making so much noise. But my postdoctoral work was with the Deep Sea Drilling Project, which was at the time, state-of-the-art technical challenges. Um, Seagoing research projects are usually, especially geologic ones, they're designed around some kind of a project that you can address by taking um, samples. So you might drop a piston core or you drop something that lands with such a thunk that it penetrates into the, into the floor and that the, the cohesiveness of the sediment holds it together while you bring it up. But if you really want to take a sophisticated approach, the deep sea drilling project in 1968 um, would had a moon pool like a lot of exploration um, ships do these days, but it would stay on a station, drill in waters kilometers deep and do drill into the sea kilometers deep. And the places where it would be bringing back samples were specifically chosen to help address a particular scientific problem. We were interested on my first deep sea drilling cruise in understanding how a, an overriding plate, in this case, the plate off of Central America, interacts with the plate over which, well, the subducting plate, the oceanic plate, the Pacific plate. And that area here at the tip was really interesting. So of course, that's about five kilometers in depth. And I won't say a whole lot more about sea stories, but I have to tell you this one. Um, brand new drill string, five kilometers of, of pipe going down to the seafloor and then drilling in another couple hundred meters. How many of you have been out to sea in a, in a deep, even, even a little vessel? You know, they go like this, or they go like this, or they go like this. When the drill string split right up underneath the ship, I bet you've never been on a ship that goes like that. <laughs> well, that boy Young brought all the engineers and oilers out, everybody that was working below decks, because everybody could tell from the motion something was wrong. And well, that's my best sea story from my drilling days. Um, no disasters. We actually had enough drill string to complete the mission. We were out for two months and uh, the groundwater sold us a lot. The other thing that we were after, clathrates, which are a kind of organic molecule that can contain huge amounts of methane, extraordinary amounts under the kind of pressure that you have when you're at those sorts of depths at sea. and when you're not at those depths, can explosively uh, release all that methane and reduce the density of the water so that when we were drilling and bringing up clathrates along that same overriding plate, the um, safety manager was in constant contact with land to let them know that we'd reached the clathrate, that we were drilling through it, and that no, it hadn't released enough of it to make the water so dense, so undense that it could no longer sustain the ship and we'd sink. So we were happy about that. 
but um, while I was at Tulane University in New Orleans, um, I called a friend that I was working with on a paper that we were writing about some of our drilling work. And he had moved up to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is part of the Caltech, California Institute of Technology. JPL is a lot like RFSA. NASA has a lot of research centers that are all government run and government oriented. And one research facility that's not government and can do things on behalf of NASA that NASA as a government organization can't do. For example, they were able to hire me as a visiting senior scientist to go and work at NASA headquarters and be their first female um, geology program manager, just like RFSA can do some things on behalf of RFS that, that are legitimate. Everyone's aware that they're going on, but because the government entity is a little bit paralyzed in some regards, um, it's handy to have a friend who's not. So, I went to work first as the geology program manager and um, soon with personnel and programmatic changes ended up having geodynamics, um, which looks at movement on the surface of the earth, geopotential fields, so that's magnetic field and gravity field, and of course geology. And as, as Andrew said, anything that you could learn about those fields from a space-borne platform or an airborne platform were things that would fall into those program jurors. We actually had archeology span as well because it's old, right? <laughs> Everything else that you looked at from was a uh, fairly short-term events. But just a, a quick, as Andrew said, and at that particular time when I joined NASA in the mid eighties, um, we weren't even allowed to say global warming because Congress was very sensitive about it. Yet things haven't changed much in all these years. So it was called global change and became climate change. So there's some recognition. I think warming is still probably the essential thing because all of this is happening so quickly on scales of decades instead of centuries and millennia. Um, climate change as a result of the warming is, is mainly what we're seeing, but we'll get into that some other time. I could give you a talk on any of these slides at any time if you were, if you were gluttons for punishment. Um, what am I going to say? I'm past C stories. Um, so I had I was program scientist for quite a, four or five shuttle missions, but the ones I want to talk to you about really briefly um, were the shuttle imaging radar missions that we flew in 1993 and 94. Um, those were testing a kind of imaging radar called synthetic aperture radar. And a lot of you that work with remote sensing um, know the technology I'm talking about. It looks a bit like air photos or other kinds of, of remote sensing like Landsat or, or Spot or something like that. But it uses an active signal, it sends out a signal and brings the signal back. And that reflection tells us something about the surface. So you can image uh, volcanoes in this, this particular scene was, to, was just showing how volcanoes look from an optical perspective and the clouds are all hiding everything. The radar sees through the clouds. Um, another thing that we looked at, well, no, I'll keep on with that. We, we had a particular technology that we started developing in the late eighties called radar interferometry, where two passes of radar over the same site either at different times or from different angles could tell you something a little bit more about that site. You could use the two, almost like stereo photogrammetry, right? That you use to make a stereo pair and get topography. If you had two sites from two different angles, you could look at how those return signals that bounce off process those and come up with what's called an interferogram, which would tell you about the shape of what you were looking at. And if you had some reference points that you could tie it to, then you have a topographic database. So you have the topography and that gets into some real relevant, every land-based earth science needs topography, whether you're modeling how the winds are going to go, how the sun is going to affect a slope, everyone needs topography. Um, and so we demonstrated that shuttle was sufficiently stable to use that technology was best when the astronauts were sleeping and not moving around. We, the data was a little bit less noisy then, but we demonstrated that on a, the second of these 
shuttle imaging radar missions that we flew in 1994. And it took a few years to get the funding and the approval to fly the one mission that could take both of those data sets at the same time and get us a global topographic data set that was seamless, taken all at the same time of year so we didn't have seasonal effects um, taken with the same technology so you didn't get artificial changes at different national borders because they used a different technology here and there. So it was a fantastic data set. Um, Australia was very important helping us with that one uh, because the, the, the modelers for some of the low relief areas in Australia were, were perfectionists and got rid of a lot of ambiguities. The Australian data set was about the last to be released because of that perfectionism, but, but it was a fantastic data set. There's a certain era of topo maps in Australia that if you look at, you'll see NASA at the base. That's the shuttle radar topography mission. That's data from that mission. Um, we also did ground-based. We, we worked with GPS. This is the Southern California um, Integrated GPS Network, which was a multi-agency effort. But we developed a GPS receiver technology to a point where you could, over a 24-hour period, um, have a precision of one centimeter. That gets to be important enough that you can start seeing detecting pre-seismic creep. You can see um, field sinking. And we saw some that some of the oil companies in California objected to because as they were extracting the oil, the ground surface was detectably measurably from space sinking. They weren't mad about the um, implications that it meant to landowners in the area. They were mad because it was showing that they were doing something in that particular area and that was proprietary. Nevertheless, very precise sort of a technology. I'll, I'll give you one more example of how precise it was. Um, a lot of fields in California where we were flying aircraft to um, demonstrate the technology and to get rid of some of the bugs before we put it into space uh, are clay rich. Montmorillonite is the clay that's, and any of you nodding your heads, nobody's nodding their head. Montmorillonite is a volcanic derived clay and it, it swells when it gets wet. And this technology was sufficiently sensitive to those elevation changes that it could tell if a field had been irrigated or not because the Montmorillonite clay in the soil was swelling just a few centimeters that you could detect from space or an aircraft. Um, I, Andrew did mention the White House experience and I'll talk about that really briefly. At that time in the 80s when global change was, climate change was, was really being demonstrable, um, a lot of what the geodynamics program that I'd inherited was doing was precision geodesy, locating a place on the ground very to, to within a few centimeters. And over a 10 year period, sorry, I was a bit cynical at the time, it had demonstrated that the plates were roughly moving at about the same pace as if you analyzed uh, seafloor spreading center data and the magnetic stripes on the seafloor that reflected, you, you guys all remember that from high school, but how, <laughs> or maybe you don't, all right. <laughs> um, Earth's, Earth's magnetic polarity has changed many, many, many times in Earth history. In fact, we're overdue for one. So you talk about a natural disaster over which we have no control. Um, we're probably half a million years past due for our next polarity change. Um, roughly every 300,000 years, it hasn't changed since 800,000 years ago. But what's interesting is the seafloor spreading centers, as they spread, the lava that, mold, that wells up and creates seafloor the magnetic material aligns itself with the pole at the time. So you get a, a change in polarity and suddenly they're like this. They're, you know, the, the, instead of the little ferromagnetic material pointing north, it's all pointing south because the field has changed. So you get a lovely symmetry of out from that seafloor spreading center of basically it's magnetic stripes. And if you know how old the seafloor is, you can date when those magnetic changes took place. Well,
how did I even get onto that? What was I trying to tell you? Uh, it's, it's interesting, it's overdue. Um, we have, during my tenure, we launched a few magnetics missions to try to understand better how much of that we could see coming from space. But what it led to was, that was really nice to get that affirmation that our technology that was showing in kind of an instantaneous view was lining up with what you could see by analyzing seafloor spreading centers and looking over the last few million years, but it didn't have a whole lot of societal relevance I mean, once you prove it, except that the places where it wasn't lining up, where the, where the plates were not moving at that average speed of, of millions of years, were at the places where all the interesting natural disasters were occurring. And you know the difference between a hazard and a disaster, right? Hazards are expressions of nature and disasters are where humans get in the way, basically. So, um, so that we could use that technology to measure these areas and maybe focus on areas that were particularly not conforming to averages as places where we could study natural hazards, get a bit more insight into the natural hazards. And so that was a, a new thing for the program. That was basically the creation of the natural hazards program to look at pre-seismic motion, pre-seismic creep, to look at pre-eruption swell of volcanoes, which you can also measure with, with instrumentation on the ground. Use topography to start to think about um, where the sea surge, the storm surge is going to affect something when you have a hurricane coming in. One of the things we would have liked to address when we reached out to our brothers and sisters in atmospheric science was um, getting a better handle on understanding hurricanes and how they form and most importantly for for the disaster, the human part of it, where there, where landfall will occur. And that's that's still a big raging topic, probably one of the most important ones we could could have helped to address, but it's, it's still one that's waiting to be to be solved. So uh, enough about the US, let's go to Australia. Whoops, no, that was an interesting year in my life. Um, my boss who worked on atmospheric science got recruited to work at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And within a few months of his being there as one of the four sub-directors or assistant directors, um, four federal agencies that made up NEHRP, the, Nat the uh, National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program, wrote to complain that it, all the money that they'd thrown at those four agencies, FEMA, National Science Foundation, NIST, which is the National Institute of, of, of Standards and Technology, and the US Geological Survey, hadn't made any progress in predicting earthquakes. We still haven't, this was 20 years ago. Um, but uh, my former boss from NASA asked NASA to loan me to OSTP to help address this issue. And so we put together a multi-agency and it was really broad ranging. It, it was not just the natural science effects of it. It was um, earthquake standards for buildings and uh, just, any aspect that you could think of from commercial and social into the technical aspects. And it, it took a bit over a year with um, fact-finding visits and multiple agency participations. And one of the, well, I learned two important lessons when I worked at the White House and it was the first Clinton administration. So I was very pleased to be there show my political lingerie. Um, the first lesson, and I was there, you had to get there and, and everybody was smiling at me and I was thinking, everybody was smiling at everybody. What great to be on a team where we're all striving for the same goals and we all have this wonderful um, betterments in mind. And it took me a couple of weeks to realize they didn't know who I was yet and just in case, they better give me a nice smile. Just. <laughs> The, the, other, the other lesson learned, and this, this one carries across to any big project you take on where you're going to be coming up with new ideas, new proposals, is make sure your audience, your, your expected recipient is 
not only on board, but, but geared to do something with it and, and make good use of it. This was, no, I'm not gonna compare it to having your first child, but a lot about the process, this, this whole activity, most of the agencies involved are all about the process. And we did, we handed it to FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which was the main, um, the senior player in the NEHRP program that we were trying to assist. And the very enthusiastic assistant director of FEMA for mitigation was very happy to receive it, but he left it on his desk when he went back to Massachusetts to help Michael Dukakis in his election campaign. So you have to build your, make sure your recipient is more than one deep, and more than one wide. Um, it's a great document. It was a great snapshot, state-of-the-art earthquake um, mitigation. It was nicknamed the National Earthquake Strategy at the time that it came out. But each agency had to go their own way after that. So there were some multi-agency partnerships that came out of it. The sign, the Southern California Earthquake Integrated GPS Network was one thing that came out of it. But um, it's an important lesson. Make sure your audience is going to do something with what you give them. What are you going to do with my talk? All right, we did finally get to Australia and we were delighted to be here. We came on a two year assignment, stretched it to five, um, managed to become the ambassador's science counselor for another three. And then, well, we really didn't, we went feral. We didn't want to go home. We just loved it so much here. My husband was happy to be here and the kids were. We're so glad they had a chance to get to know their grandparents. Um, but so I came out initially as the NASA attache. I'll briefly talk about when I was briefly a member of the UN Committee to Develop a Tsunami Warning System. Mainly that the, that was my goal was to show them how the network of geodetic players that we had put together in my programs at NASA had operated. And that was, at that point, we had more international partners than any other program at NASA. Um, not 100, but more than 50. I couldn't give you the exact number. But the deal was, they either had their own facility, or we would loan them one of our GPS receivers, a long-term indefinite loan, and they'd make, maintain it and provide the data from it for that they had access to all the data from every other facility that was participating. So they could put up, it, it was a fantastic sharing of information and kind of mentoring, technological mentoring of, of con participating countries that needed a leg up. And that was what I was contributing to that particular effort. What I will say about that, that I learned personally, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a bit was, um, very humbling, we had all of our fantastic technology and our big machines and things, but the people on the ground came in and, and told us, you know, the, the truth was a well-informed public was the best way to mitigate the disaster of a tsunami. You can't stop them. You can build structures to, to protect things, but remember that, remember that little eight-year-old British girl who was in, uh, where was she on the other side of the world? And the sea went out and she told people, her parents, they better get out of there. And they warned everybody and got them off the property. Um, tsunamis, you can give some good warning of when they're going to arrive. They're just like any other waves. They're, the speed of the wave is, is um, a function of its height and wavelength. And in the, in the case of a tsunami, the wavelength or the, the height of the wave from seafloor to crest is pretty much two kilometers, two and a half kilometers across the oceans, because that's about how deep most of the ocean is. So you can give come up with a pretty good estimate of when it's going to arrive. You just need to have the people on the other side know what's happening. And that's so easy. You know, if you have a 13 hours warning like they did on the other side of the ocean, um, if you have an informed public that knows what to do when it's happening. Send the alarms, you have the signs up. All right, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, for the last few years before I retired, I was uh, for six years director of the Canberra Deep Space Community. Uh, sorry, <laughs> the Canberra Deep Space Tracking Facility or CDSCC Communication Complex. 
Uh, the only thing I can say about disasters in CDSCC was was uh, how great the um, fire service was there in the uh, Canberra fires of 2003. And they, they were up there at the, at the fences. They had the hoses rolled out. They were ready to defend the facility. Fortunately, it didn't come to that, but, but um, that was an in inspiration to see that. Um, I had two years after that that I spent with the Global Forest um, GFOI, the, the Global, well, I'll, no, I won't, I won't ask you to guess, but go to your Urban Dictionary and you'll see an, an alternative interpretation of what GFOI stands for. But we, for us, it was the Global Forest Observation Initiative. And it was led by Australia with Norway and the USA as other major partners. And in this, organization, we were working with um, sweet talking all the earth observation agencies around the world into providing free data to developing countries so that they could demonstrate compliance with UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, to document their compliance with its guidance on forest deforestation and forest degradation. There was a lot of money riding on it. Uh, Norway had pledged $300 million to assist nations that, that were doing that sort of compliance. So our job was to work with developing countries that to help them analyze and interpret the data that we were getting organizations like NASA, CNES, the Italian Space Agency, et cetera, to provide so that they could analyze it, interpret it, and then represent it in the correct reporting format so that it would be acceptable as a report to the UNFCCC. So I did that for a couple of years and then retired to paradise on the South Coast. So here we are. Oh, and? This was my um, my first night effort that wasn't just blacking out something that had already happened. We were putting up we're back burning. It's not going to last very long. It's just a few seconds. That was um, taken from I I can't remember if I was photographing my captain or she was photographing me, but we were um, multiple brigade out Western Distributor Road, which is north of the. Um, King's Highway, and we were trying to hold back the curl on fire. And uh, we were, the goal was to back burn 10 kilometers. We back burned 14 kilometers, went home really proud, got home at dawn. And of course, a couple of weeks later, it just left over the whole thing. So, um, but what an exciting time to, to be. I'm sure most of you here have, have been through that and you can probably all drive through neighborhoods and tell your kids I saved this house my crew and I we did this and we did that it's a thrilling time wasn't it to be so clearly useful and helpful and it's like mowing the lawn you can look back and you've got an instant gratification for your hard effort <laughs> do you ever have your, your your work compared to the to lawn mowing but it, it's also it's a lot like seafaring and it's a lot like nasa uh in that we have these these fantastic big machines these great big toys and we can go out and do great things um but it's so worthy and so immediately useful is instant instant gratification for the work you've done is that you can look back and see that you saved this place or you help these people it's really a moving thing so uh, that's what's getting me into the community education part of my talk. I'm just going to talk to you a little bit now about my, how am I doing? Oh, geez, I got to get out of here so you can hear about NASA more. Um, our little footprint, uh, we go through Coila Lake. We've got somebody in the crowd who's on the, the brigade on the other side, on tour us, but through Coila Lake, we've got one commercial facility in our footprint. We go up just into the foothills and around, cut across Congo Road. That's us. Um, this is Prince's Highway. It's the main north-south artery road. It's a two-lane highway for most of the road, which I thought was quaint when I first got here. Cute. 
when you think of our interstates, but when you think that our interstates were part of an industrial military initiative, it puts a different light on it. Anyway, um, Dingy Road comes in along here, comes through. It's, it's not all densely forested, but the way in and out is. And this little clearing here is just is where the fire shed is in the midst of all that, that heavy, dense forest. Um, we don't have town water. We've got rainwater. The closest um, up here, there's a, a facility. Let's see, that's Congo Road coming out. Just here underneath the word Bregalia is a pressurized water source. So during the, the really dry season, we would go out there all the time. So it's not to, our tanks were at the lowest we could remember in, in our brigade corporate memory. So that was our water source, except for rain, uh, still is. Um, only one road in and out of, of the area, um, heavily forested. Uh, besides our one commercial facility, the only municipal facility we have is the sewage treatment plant for Turas's um, waste materials. So we've got two, a municipal thing to protect, a bunch of maybe no more than 350, about 330 households and one commercial entity. So when I first joined the brigade in 2015, that wasn't a whole lot of thinking about community engagement. I think it was called community education at that time. Anyway, it was kind of a different um, perspective or maybe not as, as developed as it has come to be. Um, we had basically get ready weekend and Santa at the fire shed and occasional uh, pile burn assists. 10 minutes, holy smokes, okay. Um, as, the, as the fires approached, uh, okay, we've seen that. Um, we started thinking more about what community engagement meant. We developed these pre-incident plans, residential, house by house. We did a letter drop, a mailbox drop to every residence and they were starting to get worried enough that um, we actually got over a hundred responses. I'm gonna, oh, I was gonna tell you a joke about my first get ready weekend in 2016, a little bit late in the year, we had no one come by. There was that little awareness on either side. We had one person come by. She was a um, social member, a sweet little Scots lady that um, it also happened to be um, the election in the US and she came and gave me a hug. <laughs> because she felt so bad for me. Um, all right, so what will I say? I'll show you the form that we designed. It's a bit cumbersome. We made a copy of it. An e-copy is in, in the iPad, which can be taken out with the vehicles. The most important thing about it was it helped the residents take a fresh look at their facility, at their homes. Um, I blacked out the name, but this is Rob's in my place. And I can see, it may look interesting, but I can see looking at it now, a few years later, that there's so much more we could do with it. We're coming on our five year anniversary, so we'll probably do this again. But um, what we asked people to do was to, on the front page, show us their house layout, where they had um, water tanks or water sources, where they had gas tanks, where the power lines were. If they had a property, we asked them to give us on the back where where the vehicle accesses could be. You know, you have to have three meters to get a truck in. So give us a big picture of where where you sit in the neighborhood. Um, where there's what this is a brackish water, so you wouldn't want to use it. But there's a nice big dam there, and and just a look so that if people have the time as they're en route, they'll have a sense of what's there. Most, since this is all local and we're all local, you might think we know every house and yard, but uh, we don't, of course, and this, this would be helpful. Next, beefing up, we'll probably do what Turas did when they took a look at this and said, we can do better. Is Tony still here? Oh, I can say what I like, but <laughs> a cluster. Right, take a cluster of houses where you have one and put them on a remote, remotely sensed background so you can see where the forests and the, you don't need to illustrate them and, and 
put them in a style that's going to be different from one residence to the next, make it more uniform, and put it on Google Drive so that other brigades that aren't familiar with the area can access the data too. Notice we've had to promise that this information was strictly for the use of the brigade because um, some of the sheds were built without DAs and things. <laughs> All right, the community engagement during the fires. Um, just briefly, you know, we got these lovely things. I think, is Fiona here? Did Anthony Bradstreet develop these? I think I remember him saying something, was part of the group developing them. But this was the, you know, for us, we had our huge crisis on New Year's Eve, and these were sent out. My captain and I were in our Cat 9 up the Araluan Valley, um, and the best way to get this information out to people who didn't automatically look at fires near me the way people do these days or hazards near me was to contact the president of the Bingy Residence Association and ask her to send them out, distribute them, and then post them on their Facebook site. Uh, with the pandemic, when we couldn't do, well, our one commercial entity, see the little Get Ready Weekend poster there? She posted for us, and she was very happy to have on. Um, inside a box of brochures and, and RFS show bags to share with people. So we did what we could. Um, we took got a lot of lessons, so jumping to new and old community concerns. This, people are still jittery. It's been said before at this conference. Um, the, maybe a third of our call out, especially this time of year, are people's pile burns haven't been adequately notified or someone's driving through Prince's Highway and you know fires always look bigger and scarier and closer in the dark. So if you're driving through at dusk on the way home from work and you see someone doing a notified pile burn, they'll call it in and if it's called in, that triggers us. Um, one really interesting thing, and, and we got, oops, sorry, we got this. Um, I learned this as a result of the CEF course. I think if Daniel Osborne is still in here, he was the main instructor of that course. And there's a classmate or two as well from that. Um, we were asked to have a look at our brigade's demographics. And, and I think this is true of a lot of New South Wales, how much turnover there has been. Maybe people fleeing the pandemic or looking for their sea change. But in our little neck of the woods from 2016 to 2022, so that's from the two censuses five years apart, population's grown by 50%. And that doesn't include the people who left because of the fires and were replaced by other people. So there's a lot of new people out there. And, and many of them are retirees, not as vigorous as they once were or as they think they are. We took, glad to... And a lot of them are as naive as I was when I first moved to from a city life to actually living in the bush, not just hiking through it. So there's a lot of challenges. And right now with the year as dry as it has been and all the fodder that's grown up over the last three years, it's a, it's a really good time to step up community engagement and to be talking to people and sending out our newsletters and going to Bingy Residence Association and the neighboring Congo Community Association and just chatting with them. So, okay, here's how we're responding. We're doing a whole lot more pile burn assist, five minutes, expanding into residential visits. Um, that's what we'll be doing in this coming year with an RFS provided checklist. And we're going to make the PIPs more useful. That ounce of prevention that community engagement can help with that pre-fire mitigation is so important. And RFS has, has recognized that and emphasizes it now to so much greater a degree. Um, and I guess my last word before I go to this, which was going to be the bonus video if there were five minutes, and Andrew says, okie doke, is just, all right, so that's the end of community engagement. It's been really wonderful. Every stage of what I've done has been really exciting and could only have been beaten by the next thing. So when I give this talk to kids that are contemplating a degree in science, I tell them be light-footed. Don't think you have to do what you started out doing because there's always something interesting around the corner. But I'll show you this because really, they're only, well, you'll hear about well, how important Australia is.
As an Australian and as a NASA astronaut, I've seen the real advantages that have come through international cooperation in the exploration of the solar system. In the past 50 years, there's really been no better demonstration of that cooperation than the partnership between the United States and Australia through NASA's Speech Space Network. Staying constant radio contact with robotic spacecraft exploring the solar system and beyond, NASA established three tracking stations located near Madrid, Spain, Goldstone, California, and just outside Canberra, Australia. Coordinated through the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, they form NASA's Deep Space Network. Responsibility for operating and maintaining each of the complexes falls to a close team of dedicated men and women who share their knowledge and expertise around the world. Collaboration between the three sites, Goldstone, Madrid and Canberra, is, is crucial to us. We all tend to be maintaining very similar equipment and there are certain things that alert on the different sites. We all strive to try and achieve the, the best outcomes. The cooperation is we all we have a, a real time interface with them. Anything that we need to answer, they, really, they tell us their experiences, and we also pass on any experience that they may not have. Uh, we cooperate 100%. Thank you. Since we took our first steps beyond Earth to explore the universe around us, Australia has played a vital role in the exploration of space. Antennas across the country supported NASA's first satellites and followed their astronauts as they journeyed into Earth orbit. They also provided telemetry, command and ranging for a fleet of deep space probes headed for the moon and the planets beyond. It could be quite exciting. I remember back to the days of lunar orbiter when I first started, there were several spacecraft going around the moon and you could hear the beat of a spacecraft come in as you were trying to lock up to it. A marvelous thing was how well the Americans trusted us. They trusted their judgment. They trusted us for being competent, professional people, and they listened to the people on the station. Today, the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex stands alone as the Southern Hemisphere's only deep space tracking station. Mm -hmm. Supporting the missions of many nations and dozens of spacecraft every day. Process in the communication path relies on teams of highly skilled personnel. Their work focuses on areas of antenna maintenance, systems engineering, spacecraft communications, and logistics administration. <laughs> Best thing about working here is the people. They are so sharp, so professional, so dedicated. Many of them have been here for decades, and there's something about our culture that's so caught up in getting this right and in, in making these missions work. We uh, operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so you have to choose people that are compat compatible with each other. We can be called up at any time to come out and repair an antenna and get it back online. It's a bit isolated at times, so being able to refer to, to someone else that has the exact same knowledge and expertise in the area is, is, is excellent. Dedication of staff is crucially important because they might have to make split-second decisions on their own to keep with the systems running so that the operations can get back on a spacecraft. And in the middle of the night, that's, uh, you want somebody that's totally dedicated. Yes. Incredible discoveries made in space over the last 50 years would not have been possible without the role played by the hundreds of men and women who worked at the tracking stations. They stand as an inspiration to the next generation of space explorers who just now 
and looking to the stars. It's our people I'm so proud of. It's their dedication, their professionalism. More than that, they love what they do. The anniversary of 50 years of partnership in space tracking, it's a great opportunity for us to reflect on the accomplishments in science, engineering, and goodwill of our long history. But it's also a great opportunity to look at On site, we're currently building a new state of the art antenna to usher us well into the 21st century. The success of the Deep Space Communication Complex and the Deep Space Network is founded on its people and the strength of an international collaboration stretching back to the beginnings of space exploration. It's the thrill of being a part of something that's so magnificent in concept and yet requires so much attention to detail. And these are the guys that do it. Even here, in partnership with the Deep Space Network, as long as there's a Deep Space Network. Didn't a lot of that sound like the RFS? <laughs> <laughs>